Uh, good morning, everybody, and can I welcome you to the 12th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2015. Can I remind all those present to switch off all electronic devices um, because they can interfere with the sound system. Um, our only item today is to continue the evidence taking on our inquiry into the attainment of pupils with a sensory impairment. Can I welcome to the com committee this morning Alison McGilvery from East Ramshire Council, uh, David Watt, Education Scotland, uh, Brian Shannon, Fife Council, Eileen Burns, Hamilton School for the Deaf, and Richard Hellewell from the Royal Blind. Uh, good morning and welcome to you all. Thank you uh, also for your written submissions, uh, which we have read in advance of today's meeting, and, and very interesting they were too. Our discussion today will be based on the evidence we have received so far, um, and from our visit yesterday to Craigie High School, where we met with staff from Dundee Multisensory Service and some of the pupils and parents who received support. Um, I think I speak on behalf of all the committee members who were there to say it was a very useful visit, uh, and I want to place on record our thanks to Craigie High School and the Multisensory Service for welcoming us uh, yesterday in Dundee. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm going to move straight to uh, questions from members. Uh, I'm going to begin with uh, Mary Scanlon. Thank you, Convener. I wanted to ask Marie Kelly, Education Senior Manager from East Renfrew, but I think she's become Alison McGilvery. Mary, Mary, right, Mary, okay. sorry. Marie Kelly's not here. It's no, I, 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 I now I realise oh, that. that. Okay. <laughs> you know, but I think it's Alison McGilvery, yeah, it is, yes. East Renfrew. Um, it, I was particularly uh, taken by your evidence, which I thought was very uh, thorough, your briefing paper. And uh, I would just really... The, um, sorry, I'm too busy looking at your name. And I, uh, I really just want to look, uh, generally speaking, at the role in providing early intervention support for families and children. Uh, I think I, I now have an awareness, thanks to Mark Griffin's uh, bill, etc., that... Uh, 90% of children with a, a hearing impairment are born to hearing families, so that, that's one thing. Uh, but also looking at any improvements that can be made to promote multi-agency working at the earliest opportunity, information share, sharing, etc. So it's along those lines that I want to ask. But um, uh, the first page of your briefing, uh, I'm quite impressed to see that East Renfrewshire schools hold comprehensive data on the attainment of all children through analysis of baseline standardised tests at P3, P5, P7 and S2 uh, and SQA results and also now in second year because I have to say that in comparison with the Audit Scotland report of last year they, they are saying that some councils, and I, I realise now who it is, uh, you know, look at standardised tests on a regular basis, but they also say at a council level there is no consistent approach to tracking and monitoring progress of pupils from P1 to S3. So it seems to me that you're maybe one of the better ones, if I can put it that way, that you do seem to have that information that appears to be lacking in the evidence uh, that I'm taking. So it's perhaps just to ask you, first of all, you know, how do you manage to get this baseline standardised tests, which is so critical to identifying sensory loss? Um, we do collate very robust data in the authority for all our learners. Uh, we're always improving on that. We're not, we're not complacent about the information we have, but we do have a range of information about young people's attainment. It's held within the schools and then collated centrally, so our staff can track any young person's attainment very closely and support it and intervene as appropriate. I mean, the standardised tests eh, are something that East Renfrewshire has carried out for a number of years now. Eh, they are a very good indication of a young person's progress, where they are in terms of curriculum for excellence and where the interventions are necessary, and it does support our schools and our staff to do that. I mean, you, you had asked about early intervention. Also, eh, our service... Answer in relation to nursery schools as well, yep. although I appreciate your testing doesn't take place. Yes, we, no, we, but we do have you do in place um, a very good staged intervention system so that all our staff are very aware of the needs of all the young people that they work with as soon as they come in to any of our provision, be it pre five or right on until high schools. And we they are also very aware of the range of impairments and barriers that there can be to learning. They're very attuned to whether children are making the progress they should be making. And that's where the strong 
multi-agency work comes in. We have a good joint support teams, multi-agency partnerships from very early on. We have very good work with our educational psychologists. So if there is anything that gives concern about a, a, a child's progress, that will be looked at closely and it will be followed up. Are you confident that any child, um, you know, let's say newborn to five, mm -hmm is picked up in terms of any sensory impairment and you're confident that that child is you know, not only identified but given the support multi-agency to address their needs and support them through school. If we are aware... Are you a beacon of best practice, as they say? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> no. uh, if we are uh, aware that there is a sensory impairment for a child, then uh, all of that support will come into place very quickly. I thought you said you, with everything in place, that you would be aware. I, I know from my colleagues who work in the service that sometimes it, it, someone may come into the authority from elsewhere. There may be instances where, for whatever reason, that has not been picked up by the time that a young person or child comes into our provision. But I would hope that we would very quickly identify if that was the case. Uh, we do have good relationships with our allied health professional colleagues. So there is good informa information sharing in the authority. Uh, we work with even babies in the home. We have a home visiting teacher who is separate from the sensory support service, but she works alongside that service. They will sometimes alternate visits. The home visiting teacher may be accompanied by one of the sensory support service. They may have alternate fortnightly visits from home visiting or sensory support and in that way we're also able to support families because as you see a, an understanding of sensory impairment and the impact of that for parents can be very difficult so if they are working with the right people and the right partnerships early on it can make a significant difference to how they feel and how they in turn are able to support their child. That's helpful. I wonder, convener, if I may ask about the, get it right, baseline standardised tests. Are these, I'm aware that there is no national government test, and I'm also aware that many local authorities in Scotland buy in tests from the private sector in England, and there's no comparison between one local authority and another. So when you say it's baseline and standardised, you know, given the background that's happening, I didn't think there was a standardised test across Scotland. Have I misunderstood that? It's a standardised test within the authority and, and we commission... Within your authority, yes, I we, see. We so you couldn't them. compare that with any other authority? No, we can no. only compare the progress of children against each other within the authority and we can we can, be, I, we can see where we expect them I to be. I appreciate that. And whether yeah. they're above or below that line. I I understand that better, but we couldn't make a comparison National. between yours and other authorities because they're not, they're not, not the that's only case. standardised to East Renfrewshire, uh, not across Scotland. That's very helpful. Can I, can I just move on? And, um, yeah. Yeah, of course. Well, can I ask the rest yeah. of the panel I mean, what, what your views are or your experience of um, early intervention is in terms of whether it's uh, children with hearing impairment or children with a visual impairment? We've heard what East Renfrewshire's views are, but I just would hear what the rest of the panel, and in relation to the questions Mary Scanlon has just been asking. David, can I start with you? I think it's clearly an area that we can continue to improve on. Um, we're putting in place through getting it right for every child. Uh, the approach to multi-agency working that addresses the good practice that uh, takes place in East Ren, where from zero to five, the uh, named person will be within health to identify uh, any areas that are requiring support and they are working together in partnership with uh, education and other providers to ensure that uh, the additional support needs of those children are met at an early stage. Uh, the Early Years Collaborative is uh, rolling through and has a set of stretch aims with uh, screening at uh, 30 months. Um, we in around additional support in the, within the Early Years Collaborative. It's an area that uh, requires further improvement. Thank you. Uh, Brian? I think, um, the, obviously, the newborn hearing screening programme has been in, in place in Scotland for a number of years now. Um, it was implemented very differently in Scotland compared to, to England, in that England had a, a standardised screening programme and actually a, a follow-up programme for professionals and families um, to monitor 
and intervene effectively. Within Scotland, we have a variable, we have we have a standard uh, screening program, but we have two different uh, screening methods in place depending on the different uh, health boards. And unfortunately, there's never been um, a, an actual uh, program in place to monitor the children's development. Um, in England, they used a thing called uh, the Early Monitoring Protocols, um, which was part of their Early Years program. Uh, initially, that those those materials were available in Scotland, um, but now we no longer they they are they're no longer available, and so there isn't actually a standardised method. Uh, in addition to that, um, going back to the Public Health Institute of Scotland, dating back to 2003, they actually recommended that um, at the point of uh, sharing the news with family that the child was deaf, that there should not just be a health professional, but uh, a, another professional. At that point, it said education or social services. Uh, in the early years, standards birth to three that were produced through the Scottish Sensory Centre, that was one of the recommendations. That's what we do in our area. Uh, myself and my colleague are, are, are responsible for sharing the news with the family, phoning the family the next day, um, providing families with information, making sure that families are flexible in their approach, that they, because sometimes families will start out, you know, with the, maybe wanting spoken language development as the, 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 their, their desired aim, but uh, through a, a range of factors, meaning that might not be um, achievable, and that encouraging families to be flexible in their approach and to, to have a positive aspect to deafness. And I think that can only work if we have that multi-agency working, as it were, on the ground and therefore influencing. I think there's an influence from my, myself. I, I, I've gained experience for working with my, my colleague who does the screen, but I think he's also gained a, a experience of, of the, the, the bigger picture, as it were. So I think, I think there certainly needs to be a, a training programme for, for staff. There needs to be in place a standardised method of monitoring uh, language development. The monitoring protocols has the advantage of it doesn't just do spoken language, it also does British Sign Language. So I think having us, just as all children are assessed by health visitors at an early stage user, using a standardised method, I think we need to have a standardised method to identify where children are so that a child and family centred approach to intervening to where things aren't going right can be put in place. Thank you. Eileen. Hi. <coughs> I mean, we've got newborn hearing screening, which is, is a great, a wonderful thing. That at early age, before children leave the maternity hospital, we, we know or if, if they are deaf. Uh, they are provided with hearing aids earlier as possible. Cochlear implantation has been uh, uh, taking place as er uh, earlier than, than ever before. However, within those early years, the, the idea and the, of British Sign Language being used with children right at that early stage, where it is basically the only language that they can communicate with if naturally have full access to is often not provided is not as is not a, suggested as a positive option for children with respect to the multi-agency group who's part of that multi-agency group i think is important i think with if you a child has been uh, diagnosed as deaf i think it's important we try and dispel this sort of deficit approach of oh my that's the end of the world we need to have deaf people involved in that multi-agency group where parents can say oh right this is a deaf person communicating very effectively married got children functioning within society to, to try and make it a much more positive way of, of looking at deafness uh, also I would say that health, we have to, I think, raise awareness with respect to health about the positive uh, effect of teaching children, giving children access to a language as, as early as possible, how important that is. Because often deaf uh, he, uh, health professionals are actually uh, discouraging uh, parents from making use of sign language. They're saying, but basically what they're saying is, if you sign with your child, then they're, uh, they're uh, spoken language development will actually be affected by it. And this, the evidence is, is not, that, is that is not the case. So we have to try and dispel that approach. And language delay for deaf children is something that we're, we're just accepting. 
and say, right, you're deaf, we'll give you hearing aids, we'll give you cochlear implants. We, we, we are accepting there is times in your life that you will not be able to communicate. Right? When, you're, when you're waiting for cochlear implantation, when, if you've got a cochlear implant and you take it out at night, but we're accepting there are times when you're not able to communicate. And that's because of the monolingual approach to deaf education that we have. I mean, throughout the whole of the world, bilingualism is thought of as a, as a fantastic thing for cognitive development. But when it comes to deaf children, it's, it's considered, no, don't sign. And, and I know that is the, the advice that deaf children, deaf parents, are being, the, parent, the parents of deaf children are being given. And if you're told by a consultant at the, that don't sign with your child, that's going to have a massive effect on how you're going to view British Sign Language. And I think... If, if, to, for, to raise the attainment of deaf children, what we have to do is, is allow them to develop cognitively. And to do that, they need a language. And there's a language there which they can have access to, but we're denying them access to it. So I think from an early age, we have to say, oh, your child's deaf. You know what? British Sign Language might be a good thing to learn. You know, and say, because, you know, from the early stages, you, their, their mind will be developing, they cognitively become cognitively active. And... Uh, and we have to support that. We have to support that. And we have to say, right, eh, we're going to eh, provide you with sign language classes in the, the home. That is practice in Scotland. I'm, saying that, I'm not saying that doesn't happen. It does happen. It happens. And there is good practice in that. And we have to learn from that. But it's not the norm. It's not the norm. Children are, expect, are, we are leaving children with no language so that we can focus on the spoken language. And I, I think to improve the attainment, my, my experience is if we can give language, Early, as early as possible, and there is a language there. It's not going to be easy, eh, but by supporting parents, teaching them sign language in the home, making it accessible, allowing them to learn it, because going to a class might not be a reasonable thing to do for somebody who's just got a new baby. You have to, you have to sort of think outside the box and provide support for families to learn sign language, dispel that de deficit idea that it's, you know, it's that that. Eh, spoken language will be held back because of you're using sign language. The opposite is the case. So. Thank you very much, Eileen. And Richard. Thank you. Um, in, in the field of visual impairment, there is, a, there is an echo of what's just been said about sign language in the use of Braille. Of course, it's not a distinct language in anything like the same way, but it is the means of access to the written word. Um, and the time that a child best learns Braille is the time when his or her peers are learning to read. It's those same connections that are being made and those same skills that are being learned. Um, and, and where early intervention comes in is very much that Braille needs to be front-loaded, um, as do other aspects like habilitation, um, de um, living skills, um, and, and the equipping of access to the whole curriculum from as early as possible. Um, because that's what gives the child confidence and it gives the child target setting, it gives them uh, something to aim at um, and, and helps the child realise that they can be part of this whole education thing along with their peers um, and approach that with confidence. Um, a huge amount of, um, of inclusion is about confidence and, and the young, child or young person feeling that they can be included, they can assert themselves. Um, the things that they do, say, motion, whatever, are affecting their environment and other people's response to them. It needs to happen as early as possible in the school career and regrettably it doesn't always. There is a lot of excellent practice around. Um, but. I think there's been a few influences over the last 10 or 15 years that have led to phased interventions. Um, they've led because of well thought through and, and good ideas in terms of policy, in terms of presumption that you start with the mainstream classroom. Too often, though, that means you're starting somebody where they're going to fail and then there needs to be remedial work and catch up. It needs to be the other way around. The interventions that give the child those, um, those, that confidence and that access to the written word need to happen first, and then the inclusion in the classroom is much more effective thereafter. Thank you, Richard. Sorry, Mary. Thank you. It was very helpful. I just didn't want to <laughs> uh, take advantage. Uh, I've just got some final questions here, but if I can just lump them together. Um, you, m most of you have talked about the screening for newborn. Uh, the National Deaf Children's Society, in their evidence uh, last week, uh, told us that the guidance on that uh, initiative um, it still hasn't been published. It came out in 2005 but there still hasn't been guidance, and perhaps that could uh, explain why 
there is different practice uh, across Scotland. But if I can go back to Alison, uh, page three. Um, I can't pretend that I understand this, but I wonder, convener, if she could explain. Uh, there are mo many more children being diagnosed with a conductive hearing loss who display auditory processing disorder, APD type difficulties. I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. It would be helpful just if I could get um, an explanation. These children could benefit from programmes worked on at home and also in the nursery. My second question is, um, we're talking about best practice and working together and integrated health and social care. So I'm actually quite shocked that you find it very difficult to get information from the health service for children and young people seen at ear, nose and throat departments. You get it from audiology, but there seems to be an unwillingness to share information, which is obviously detrimental. And my final point, convener, uh, which I don't think is being picked up in lines of questioning later, is a recommendation that Scotland should consider the introduction of building guidelines, such as Building Bulletin 93, which is mandatory in England. I'm not sure what Building Bulletin 93 would bring, but it would be helpful if you could explain to us how that would benefit buildings in Scotland right. and what it is. Uh, first of all, the auditory processing disorder, there are people sitting here who are far better qualified to explain that than I am, so I, I, I would look to my colleagues on this panel to give you a, a proper explanation and of the impact of that. Um, to be fair to health colleagues, to take the point about ear, nose and throat, uh, a lot of good practice in supporting any additional support need comes down to good relationships. And it can take time to foster relationships, whether it's with colleagues within education or with health colleagues. There are very strong links with our teams to the audiology departments in hospitals, but there are not the same clear pathways about who's contacting whom, who, who, who to get in touch with when it comes to diagnosis done through ears, nose and throat. This is what my team are telling me. Uh, so that, hence, their desire to have that information, any health professional who's aware, as soon as they are aware of a sensory impairment for a child or young person. The NHS to give you that information, which would obviously be beneficial right. to the child. I, I would not want to characterise it as a, an unwillingness, okay. but I think there are things that could be done to improve the level of communication okay. when it comes to that early identification and diagnosis. And sometimes links are made and then there are restructurings or changes in whatever element of whichever agency is around a child and so it's a constant process of making those contacts and being clear about who's the person to get in touch with. The Building Standards 93 is I know something that they have in England and Wales uh, and again our team were concerned that where there are new builds in Scotland that uh, they should be built in such a way that they are accessible from the start, from like the first brick, and we're not going in after the event to make buildings accessible to a range of young people. We're future-proofing them to be inclusive for all the, the children and young people who are coming their way. I'm just trying to understand what, what changes, it, what it, difference would be. There would be about the... I can say that initially we have no open plan classrooms. We, are, we would not be building now with open plan. Uh, one of the strengths around supporting a uh, sensory impairment is whatever you put in place to support children with sensory impairment is going to be a benefit to a range of other children with additional support needs. Sound field systems can be a benefit to children on the autistic spectrum disorder as well. It can help concentration and focus. Uh, I think they were just citing that as an example in, in England and Wales where there's a mandatory provision. I know the preference might be that there is guidance, but I know we would aspire to the best possible learning environment for all our children, and that, that's something they would like to have considered. Thank you. You said else the auditory processing disorder. I'm happy to deal with the, mm -hmm. the three issues that were raised. Auditory processing disorder, there isn't really a standardised test. It's a, it's a phrase that's come into common usage. It's better to think of auditory processing difficulties, and, and it's, it's, it's a problem that many children can face. There's three different, different difficulties, either making sense of sound, making sense of phonics, and making sense of language. 
the reason that it primarily exists is that the ear makes, is, the ear's a bit like a piano, it makes sense of sound in the same way that a, a, a sound is always play, or always appears in the ear at the same place. And the brain expects that sound to appear in the brain, the auditory part of the brain, at the same place. For some children, the sound leaves the ear at the correct place, but the brain doesn't pick it up in the right location. And therefore, they find making sense of sound quite challenging. They can find literacy quite challenging because it's a phonics-based system. Actually, in Fife, we've been developing a system using sign to overcome those challenges, and we've used with deaf children quite successfully, and we've used with some now hearing children. So that's that's the, the core, if you like, of auditory processing difficulties. Um, the, in the relation to the, the ENT issue, which is certainly a common problem throughout Scotland, but to give you a, a kind of indication of the, the, the difficulties, as it were, according to the NICE guidelines, 80% of children at some point will have OME, otitis media with infusion, which is glue ear. Okay. The, the most, the, by the age of 10, sorry. So the most, uh, the, the most, uh, the, 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 the mean for that, that period of, of, of glue ear is generally between um, six and ten weeks, which is roughly, you know, a term in the school. Um, so quite often ENT will get a, a range of children coming through, uh, or GPs will get a range of children coming to them and they'll do a watch and wait, which is appropriate medically, but it fails to understand the challenges then that presents for children in the classroom, because the younger you are, the bigger impact glue your has. If you're a youngster developing their language skills or in the early primary, that has a bigger impact than say you're a 16 or 17 year old whose brain has fully matured to sound. And in a sense that comes in to tie into the Building Bulletin 93 issue. Deaf children, pr 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 primary, primary difficulty that are using auditory systems to sound are either the mechanical part of the ear doesn't work, namely the sound is attenuated, it's much quieter, or you have a sensory neural difficulty, which is that not only is the sound quieter, but it's distorted. So the brain requires a nice signal. In addition to that, which is where I think to look at deaf attainment within the wider, or the barriers to deaf attainment within the wider barriers to attainment across the board, especially for children from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, is that the, the brain doesn't mature, it matures at different rates to sound, but in addition to that, it requires a good, strong language base to, and, and good working memory to make sense of what it's hearing. Um, and so in a, in a classroom, if it's a noisy or you've got a lot of reverberation, reverberation just means an echoey, open plan. Yeah. The difference between, say, a, a, a gym hall and a classroom is one's very echoey. But some classrooms are very, very echoey. It can be very echoey then that degrades the signal for everyone. And therefore, for deaf children, if we think that, if we think of the ENT issue again, if we think that in every primary school, 80% of children at some point are going to have hearing difficulties, then you want to make sure that the schools are built to a standard that mean that everyone can hear clearly. I would say that Building Bulletin 93 sets out that, but it's also quite discriminatory because it sets, for instance, a, a reverberation time of 0.6 for primary schools and 0.8 for secondary schools. And that's based on the presumption that children's brains mature to sound. But if we think that we're living in a, an inclusive um, society at the present moment, a lot of children in classrooms, will their brains are not so fully mature to sound. So we should be setting a standard for primary schools, for all builds, and we should be trying to identify rooms within buildings that would be set for deaf children at point four, so that we have a more inclusive buildings. Thank you. Move on uh, to our next uh, area. Uh, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Convener. Um, one of the things I found a wee bit frustrating has been the, the quality of the data that supports some of the assertions that we've heard made in evidence. And just as an example, um, We've got here four different figures for the number of children with visual impairment. 869 on the register for blind and partially sighted. 2080 quoted in a TESS article. 2200 Scottish Sensory Centre. 3544 identified by Education Scotland. I mean, how can you ensure that you're providing adequate provision, that you're providing the correct support, 
if you just don't have any figures to work on that are reliable? I pick up on the data. Um, the the data is not uh, Education Scotland. That's the data from uh, schools um, right across Scotland. So um, in September each year, they complete a census um, uh, to identify a whole range of factors, including aspects related to additional support. Uh, the figures for um, additional support, I think, have been improving as a, in terms of quality of data. Um, but it, it's not measuring the same thing as blind or partially, uh, partially sighted. It's asking teachers and uh, schools to identify those that require additional support due to a principal factor of uh, visual impairment. So that could be at a, a more sensitive uh, level than blind or, or visually impaired. And the same in terms of hearing impairment. That's not children who are deaf. That's uh, schools picking up and possibly they're picking up in the go ear uh, because they know who the young people are in front of them. They know the, the challenges they face. And um, th that's a sensitive def definition of what is required in, attempt in terms of additional support. And it, it represents the views of teachers as to who requires additional support to benefit from school education. So what you're saying is that this 3,544 are the ones that are, are, are the sen sensory impaired children who have been identified and are receiving some form of support or provision within the school system? That's the that's the what we ask for teachers to record in the census, and that's what that data is. Um, I should mention that um, the education committee uh, here was. Uh, 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 a major contributing factor to improving the data in this form because you asked us back in 2010 to take fuller account of those with mental health issues, young carers looked after and those with sensory impairment and as a result of that there was uh, legislation introduced an amendment to the 2004 Act that asked us to report and record uh, right across additional support and the quality of that data now um, continues to improve and looking nationally and internationally, uh, no one has that range of data around uh, the prevalence of additional support needs, the educational outcomes they receive, and the positive destinations that are recorded. We know more and more about these children. Actually, a voluntary process, uh, and not everybody opts to do that. And it's something that is, uh, it, it, it means that the official statistics of how many blind people and how many partially sighted people there are is usually understated. It's actually probably more of an issue with uh, people of working age and older than it is with young people. But nevertheless, there is a big problem at the moment with, uh, with uh, blind registration to make it actually something that uh, is more commonly gone through um, by people who suffer a sight loss. Um, I, I would, would echo what's being said. It's the, it's the larger figure you should go by. Um, and, uh, another um, factor with registration is that it's a work-based definition of blindness. It's based on practical ability um, to do work. Whereas, of course, what we're more interested in around this table today is educational attainment. And the two are similar, but they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, so there is a danger in taking one set of statistics from a measure that is to measure something and um, using it any, any more than as a broad indicator of the numbers that are out there. Wouldn't you agree it creates confusion yeah. if different organisations are quoting different conflicting figures? I mean, we sit, we sit here mm -hmm. and we try and make sense of all this and try and get our heads around exactly what the, the dimensions of this are, and yet we have a multiplicity of figures. How do yeah, we, how do we agree, agree entirely. But what we, what we have, I mean, the, the main thing at this point with the statistics we've got is getting past the view that they're conflicting, but towards an understanding of why they're actually different figures, because they actually mean something different from each other. Um, but yes, absolutely, it makes it hard to get into the subject. Yeah. Do you think the, do you think the confusion over the figures has affected any of the service provision? I, I can I just see. Uh, why I think possibly within, within deaf education there is that some people are providing higher figures than others. If you are looking at children who, ha have who need additional support within schools, often the children who have a mild hearing loss, so there's a lot of them, will not be included in those figures, although they will be in included in the cried figures. And, and so that's possibly why there's a discrepancy. I don't, I feel, 
at my experience of, of supporting children with uh, deaf children is that we have quite good, I would say we, we, we know who the children within our authority are who are deaf. There are some issues about having maybe a late, being told, uh, being told late about a child, maybe you'd like to have known and been involved earlier, maybe due to information coming from from a audiology later for some reason or not. But I want to tell you about a, a, an example of good practice with respect to multi-agency working. In the last authority I worked in a monthly, I would go and sit with the ENT consultant in the audiology clinic and meet with parents and children of deaf, deaf children coming through the clinic. And I become quite clear realised quite early on that that was a very, very important meeting. I could find out about their hearing loss, find out changes, find out about what's happening, if they're going to an operation, etc. And I could quite quickly change the support which I could provide. That is good practice, but unfortunately, I think it's going to be threatened, that, that type of practice of education and audiology and health sitting together and meeting with parents and children because of the centralisation of the health service in the west of Scotland with the new hospital and things, audiology might well be moved to there. And it would be more difficult for local authorities out with to come and meet just with their, with their client base because their client base will maybe have appointments all over the place within and it won't be realistic. Looking at, uh, I mean, with this confusion, how, how is it going to be resolved? that um, we're looking at educational attainment and therefore um, I think notice should be given to um, the data that we have in education. It can still be improved, but um, we are um, identifying within schools um, more young people with additional support needs. Those figures uh, continue to increase. If we're getting things uh, right in terms of support, we should now be expecting those figures to decrease because we've put in place the support that, that has met needs. Um, I think that um, there could be role for greater greater publicity for the, the Scottish figures and and what it's what it's telling us. We're we're going to review the census and how it applies in Scotland, uh, and what we would aim to do for that is is to have a degree of greater consistency across the education authorities. Some education authorities are identifying 10% of the pupil population with additional support needs. Uh, others are identifying in the low 30s. And uh, I think if we can standardise and have greater consistency, um, we, we would be looking to ensure that there's not a misallocation of resources within that. Just to, just to touch on another sort of a conflict in the information given. East Renfrewshire Council have indicated that in terms of visually impaired and, and, and hearing impaired children, that their attainment levels are at least equal to uh, other pupils and in some cases better, which conflicts a little bit with some of the stuff we've been hearing from elsewhere. But there is a, an element of support there from Education Scotland because in terms of uh, positive destinations, Education Scotland are stating that uh, you know, visually impaired and hearing impaired uh, students are performing well and above national average. So there's some support there for, for East Renfrewshire's view, but it's still at odds with everything that we've heard up to now. I'd be interested to know how that comes. I don't, I don't think um, we're complacent that the uh, uh, the attainment outcomes for uh, deaf children and those with a visual impairment are not, they're not good enough. They're below national averages um, in terms of the overall tariff score and the range of qualifications they get. So there's, there's, there's no complacency here. Um, we need to do better. Uh, we need to do better by those with additional support needs right across the piece in terms of Scotland. So if you've got an additional support, you can, you can be achieving at 60% uh, of the national average, and, and that's not good enough either. It's where we are in, in Scotland just now, and it's about um, our schools are good schools, but within the school, it's who you are within that school. It's the background you bring, it's the nature of your uh, additional support needs, and schools uh, could go further to uh, do better by those with additional support needs. So why is East Renfrew so different? Uh, I, I'm delighted that we are in the position we are in with regard to our young people. I think uh, it's 
their success and we have supported them to achieve that. As, as David says, we're not complacent. We're talking about small numbers, perhaps, and we're talking about specifically those for whom sensory impairment is the sole barrier that we're aware of to their uh, learning. Um, we have a vision for all learners in East Renfrewshire to achieve. It's very important to us that that is the case, whatever level of attainment they can accede to. Uh, we have the data. We have a, a, It's not magical stuff. It's a lot of what's described in various documents as good practice. Qualified, qualified, committed, passionate teachers who are very nurturing in their approach. So they're looking at the health and well-being of these young people as well as supporting them to act, removing barriers to their learning. They're uh, producing confident, independent young people who are able to talk about their needs and understand the different things that can be done to address those barriers to their learning because the sensory support service staff can't be with them all the time in schools. And then that brings me to the fact that we have very good schools that these young people are, are learning in. So our staff, our sensory support staff, are working alongside other staff who are equally committed to removing barriers to learning for all young people, not just those who go on to university, but to see that every young person achieves the best that they, they possibly can. I think we're good at listening to learners and seeing what, what they want when it comes to uh, different equipment or adaptations. We talk to the young person, we see what they want to use, what they're comfortable with. We have an instance of a young man going on to university who has not uh, made use of a radio transmitter throughout his secondary school career, but thinks that that might be something useful to him. So we are supporting him to trial out different models and he can have one with him. To, for the transition into university. So it's about listening to what the young people want as well and, and working with families. We're thinking about learning friendly approaches. Maybe one of the challenging curriculum for excellence is there's is more active learning. There's maybe a bit more noise in classrooms than there was 40 years ago. And that's, I think, a good thing for learners. Get, uh, but we need to make sure that it doesn't impede the learning of uh, young people with any kind of sensory impairment. Uh, we, we're proactive in seeking out up-to-date equipment. I know that uh, in my time and my involvement with the service, if a young person has needed something to help them access their learning, then that has been supplied uh, as soon as possible. We don't have delays. We don't wait for budgets to be renewed. They get what they need to access their learning. And there's very good communication between the sensory support staff and schools, between the sensory support staff and the partners that they work with, and between the sensory support staff and parents. So all of that together, it's, it's just sound practice in meeting learners' needs. Um, check. Good morning. <coughs> I wonder if I may ask Mr Watt a question. You said there's no complacency, and I accept that. We also said there are good schools and there are bad schools. We've had an indication of East Renfrewshire, possibly because of geographical considerations, economic considerations. Why do we still have bad schools? I'm, I'm not sure I would have said bad schools. I think we're, we're Scottish, Scottish schools are, are good schools overall. We're providing a good service. I said it was, it's who you are within that school. Um, in terms of uh, schools that need to improve, I think the challenge is that, um, and it's a challenge that's taken up across Europe with greater success than we have, it's about equity and inclusiveness and ensuring that the environment you're working in is taking note of who you are and the needs that you can uh, uh, engage with. So it's that question of a, a, a social, <coughs> social justice agenda that uh, your, your gender your gender, your disabilities, your social background, they should not be a barrier to how well you do in schools. So maybe you can tell me in terms of, you said there are no bad schools, uh, but in, in terms of local authority support, where do you, uh, where would you say that there's insufficient local authority support to achieve what we're trying to do in terms of the attainment of those with sensory impairment? Which are the bad authorities? Um, we work with authorities to uh, self-evaluate their, their uh, progress. Bad authorities, as far as you're concerned? Well, I, I, I'm not sure that there's, that's a, a question about uh, 
that meets the needs of children and young people that uh, authorities and schools across Scotland are, are, are delivering on the capacities for uh, the curriculum for excellence. They're providing the support. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, happen on a, a coherent basis uh, across an authority because what happens is, uh, given the general level of, of good schooling, it's within school differences. So we were told this through the OECD that um, um, schools uh, generally provide good, but it can be into a classroom within a school and a, a teacher within a school. And it's about consistency of good practice, both across the school and across the authority. Um, other authorities that do better with those with uh, deaf and hearing impairments, uh, that, that the case is, is so that uh, um, even taking into account social background, there are authorities that uh, do better by, the, by those young people um, with deaf and hearing impairment. And I think we should be looking to, to challenge them further. Okay. Let, me, let, let, me, let me just move, if I may, convene on to uh, the, the issue of um, data in terms of providing a, an accurate picture of, of attainment. It, it suggests that the Scottish Government uh, ASN data, additional support need data, is limited as only reports on the qualifications achieved by pupils uh, when they, they leave school. However, non-ASN pupils' attainment data are also collected uh, at S4. Do you think the current data provides an accurate picture of the attainment of pupils with a single sensory impairment, or if not, what's the merit of collecting additional attainment data specifically for pupils with a single sensory attainment? Perhaps uh, uh, Mr Shannon might put a comment on that. Um, oh, as, as with our, our authority uses the uh, uh, clicks data using uh, the, the Durham University's CEM, uh, a, it's called the AFE assessments in children, just as in East Rambershire, the children set the assessments in primary one, three, five and seven, and then there are obviously the national qualifications um, at, at secondary level. The, certainly that, that data provides um, very useful information on where children are at uh, across a broad range of um, subject areas and I think that we do need to really focus upon issues around literacy because that's an area that's been traditionally um, poorly served by, by deaf, for, for deaf children as it were um, and I think we need to I would agree that we need to look to where there is good practice and, and follow that good practice um, in our authority, we've had a, quite a bit of success with children who've been using BSL within a mainstream setting and have had, using the AFE data, uh, age of, and not only age-appropriate language, but you know, language um, base two years above their, their, their chronological age. And I think we need to, to look to, to, to those types of successes. We need to look to where we can have a, um, we need to look at the models of support that are in place for deaf children. The curriculum has changed quite drastically over the last 20, 30 years, but the models of support for deaf children have remained relatively quite similar. A lot of, you know, and I see in a lot of the submissions it was back to, you know, restricting, restricting the curriculum further, one-to-one -one support. And I think we need to look to where we offer kids that ch chance to be resilient to chant to take risks uh, quite often deaf children can feel quite reluctant to take those risks to be wrong and i think we need to look at where where the those uh, where there are successes i think the afe that blind testing is really helpful because then it's it's if you like quite independent uh, rather than sometimes internal assessments can be um, subject to you know great inflation a period of risk for, for any pupil uh, is at S4. Uh, do, you not, do you not think that whether by reporting on attainment of pupils with ASN at S4, as opposed to the, the earlier ones or, or later ones, creates significant problem in assessing attainment at, a specific, at that specific age? It would be better to be absolutely to have robust assessments throughout the, the, the primary period and not just at at S4, we need to have, um, we need to we need to know where deaf learners are at in their learning, 
and um, and and so that that that, that gap as I said, can be bridged. It comes back in part to the data because, as I said, it's for children that have got a, 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 you know, a, a sensory neural type deafness, they will come through the newborn screen. For children with uh, gluey or other such issues, I, I, you know, they'll be, they, they may be missed within the system. Uh, so there's, there's definitely an issue around finding the, finding the data, but there certainly needs to be um, ass assessments and seeing where they are in relation to their hearing peers uh, throughout the primary system. Okay. Thank you. Liam, did you have a brief supplementary? Yeah, it was just interesting. I think it was following on from David Watch's response to, to Chick earlier on. I, we've wrestled with this idea that the Scottish Government have uh, uh, insisted that what they want to do is raise attainment across the board as well as closing the attainment gap. And I think we've been wrestling whether or not there's a, an inherent sort of contradiction uh, there. I'd be interested in, in David Watt's assessment of where that good practice is, is established and, and recognised. Is there more of a, a, a sort of uh, evidence base that resources are put in in order to support that in a way that they maybe aren't in other areas. That's not to say that it, there isn't provision and um, there aren't services be provided and that, that may have strengths and weaknesses, but actually in terms of the commitment to resource to the level that's needed, the good practice is, 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 uh, is emerging from those areas where there is that, that willingness to target the resource to meet the, meet the need. Well, the good practice that we find, we find within, within schools so the um, recent inspections across a number of schools, uh, Calderside Academy, Clydeview Academy, uh, Dale High School, Grange Academy, uh, St Margaret's Primary, um, Carlogi Primary in Angus. So across the country in different areas, it's uh, both uh, the level and nature of the support going into um, schools and mainstream classes. And then I think there's also an element of... Um, deaf young people working together within uh, within the school to ensure that they, they're not uh, social isolated or excluded and that they can participate fully uh, within within those classes. So I think there's both a, an aspect of support, but I would echo Brian's point about uh, young people being more confident. And, and uh, I think that's an area to go into next, right across additional support needs that we, sh we can expect young people to assert what they need in order to do better in the school and schools to be more responsive to them. Um, we held a, a, a deaf learners conference just recently. Um, over 60 young, young, young deaf people came to meet. First time they'd ever been in uh, a room with that many uh, deaf young people. And uh, they set out some of their challenges and their needs support. But they also set out some of their achievements. And, uh, you know, it was heartening to hear that uh, the British champion motocross is uh, uh, deaf, that somebody in the Scottish national sailing team is deaf, that young people are, are taking pride in how they represent themselves around their school and how they gain awards within their school. So that aspect of their achievement um, has perhaps not been remarked upon, but uh, mm. some, de some terrific young deaf people out there. I can understand the, the argument that having a more, I suppose, demanding constituency of, of, of interest helps in terms of making the, the, the case for, for improvements. But actually, however it comes about, um, I think what I'm trying to get at is whether or not, uh, whether or not there is a resource implication that requires um, local authorities and individual schools to prioritise investment into this into this area, um, uh, in order to make it in order to make it work, or are there examples of, of, of good practice where the resource doesn't appear to be particularly targeted, but just by happenstance you have a group of excellent teachers who work collaboratively with their, with their counterparts in health services and, and, and other areas that just kind of gets round the problems that others uh, others struggle to get round. I mean, in that yeah. one, I mean, David mentioned a lot of good practice there, and I know a lot of these areas, these, these schools, were, and, it is, and it is, there are, it's good practice throughout Scotland. Most of the, the schools that David's mentioned, if not all of them, have resource-based provision for their deaf children. Uh, and 
I, I think that deaf people have been telling us for a long time that individually placed in a mainstream school is not a, the ideal way for them to to be educated and, and also the social experiences in that way are, are, are very limiting and quite isolating and can have issues in mental health. The Salamanca statement, I mean, that was the, the real cornerstone of our inclusion philosophy that we has taken forward, or the, the practices within this, this uh, country and the, in, in the rest of the world, and to, to a certain extent as well. But even within the Salamanca statement, which was such an inclusive document, it really was saying deaf children should be going to their mainstream school or the opportunity to go to their mainstream school. Within that document, I remember reading it, and there was a paragraph that said, however, deaf children or deaf blind children, due to their communication needs, their needs may be better served in a resource base or a special school. And I remember when I read that, I thought, wow, you know, this document is really promoting inclusive education. But it's understanding that maybe that presumption of mainstreaming is something for deaf children. We should be saying, yeah, you need access to a mainstream education. But do you know, do you know what? You need a, a deaf peer group too. You need maybe the opportunity for BL, BSL to develop. You need specialist staff. But more importantly, a social, a group of deaf children who you can communicate with effectively, naturally. And I, I feel that the best practice throughout Scotland, I would like to see more of places for resource spaces for deaf children to come together and be educated together because deaf people have been telling us for a long time there's a group called the deaf ex mainstreamers group right and what they basically do is they campaign they've had an, a mainstream experience of being individually placed and they're campaigning they're com campaigning to say I don't, we don't want that for our deaf children we want deaf children to be to have a peer group and to be educated together and have access to specialist staff especially with respect to teaching english to deaf children i mean deaf children if, don't have to be taught English in a completely different way. They don't hear. They, when we read something, we can say, oh, that doesn't sound right. They, can, they don't hear that. So therefore, the, the verb to be has to be taught to them. The irregularities of English has to be taught as a second language. I often think it's, it's a wee bit like t learning Latin, right? Because BSL has a different word order. English is uh, from English. It's, it's quite a, a difficult skill job to teach deaf children English. And if you're in a resource space with with teachers who are skilled and qualified in, and understand the challenges of learning English, I would say that the literacy skills of deaf children could improve. Um, but on the question which is mainly about where should we invest, um, I think I would want to stress training and qualification. Um, certainly from our angle as visual impairment, the qualification on teaching with a visual impairment is something that is needed to keep the quality up. Um, our submission mentions, and I think other submissions have mentioned, that there is a bit of a demographic problem, um, a little bit of a manpower planning problem coming up um, with retirals, and there really is a need to have the expertise there, because that's what makes the whole thing work. People who actually know how to set targets and know how to arrange an environment for a, a child with a visual impairment. Uh, in the classroom situation, similarly, investment in training and um, and and organising the provision of habilitation, um, which, although it's not academic attainment measured in the same way as the other academic attainments, it must not be forgotten, um, because for a child with a visual impairment, they need to know they need to know the techniques to get by in daily life, um, because to hold down a job, they don't only need to have academic success but they also need to know how to handle when you're being given a cup of tea or coffee. Very simple things like that that actually don't come naturally to somebody who can't see. Um, and they do need a, a good solid input of those habilitation skills through the school career. I was going to come back to mainstreaming later on, but it, it would appear more sensible to bring it in now because it's um, mentioned it, no? No, cause I, I, we're going to go into some of the teaching stuff that was with Gordon, if you don't mind. So we'll come back to I'll come back. I, I'll okay. come back to you, though. Gordon. Okay, thanks very much, convener. And thanks, Richard, for that introduction, because I'm actually just going to start asking some questions about teaching staff in specific. Um, you know, we, we heard that there is a lack of qualified teachers to support pupils with sensory impairments. And your own evidence said quite clearly there are many qualified teachers that are visually impaired who have retired. And this has left a huge deficit in those who are able to fully understand how to educate pupils with a visual impairment. And we've also taken evidence to suggest that across the 32 local authorities, there are only a handful of audiologists and a lack of teachers who have appropriate BSL qualifications. 
So my question is to the panel members is um, what practical steps can be taken to address the shortfall? Shall I come in just with one suggestion? Yeah. That is, I think we need to um, to build that specialism as actually being a respected specialism and something that people actually want to go into and has a career progression in it. Um, I think uh, if you, I, I, I suspect that the, the the trend towards mainstreaming in the last 20 years has made basically mainstream teaching and um, generalism in, in teaching staff being the thing to aim for, um, which is honourable and good. Um, but you do need people around who have the detailed expertise. And there needs to be a recognition, I think, um, of the people who have that. Um, one, one possibility is, uh, is maybe to set up a pay structure that actually has some little incentive there for people who do that. Within the Royal Blind School, we do. We have an, an addition to your salary if you have QTVI and, um, and contracted Braille skill. Um, if you have both of those, um, then, then we pay a little incentive payment on top. I think that's something that could be done across Scotland. It would just as just as part of a of a strategy that is about recognition, about seeing these people as professionals who are important in the environment. I, I agree with that, and I think that there is no incentive for anyone to become a teacher of the day for a financial incentive. With respect to the level of BSL skills of teachers, to become a teacher of the deaf, you need to have BSL level one, which is just a basic level of BSL to become. I would like to see that increased to at least at level three, so that if you are working with deaf children, you can provide BSL as an option. Because often what's happening is teachers of the deaf are working with deaf children and their signing skills are such that they can offer BSL. And actually, maybe subconsciously, that's why they don't offer it, because they can't provide it. So I think it's important that we... I think there's 10% of, of teachers of the deaf who are a supporting peripatetically in Scotland have BSL level three or above. So 90% have lower. So I would like to see local authorities who, who are, there's good e examples of good practice with local authorities paying for teachers to go through the BSL levels. And some teachers, I would say on, on the whole, in, over the last 10 years, the BSL skills of teachers in Scotland has improved. Things are improving, but we need to get more teachers up there with good level BSL skills so they can actually offer it as an uh, option uh, with their, to their deaf children. I would say that it's a, a, a two-way process because I think we've got to attract really good teachers. That's actually, you know, people that are actually interested in and wanting to, you know, uh, help deaf children learn. In the past, there was an incentive, and it, but it was quite small, and I don't think, it, con considering the level of training, it would necessarily be a big incentive. I think it actually was what the incentive was that they, they wanted to work within the field. And I think um, really making sure that we are getting, you know, from, from probationary teachers through to uh, experienced teachers, trying to get uh, a promote the profession in a sense to make sure that we are getting the right people. But I also think that we need to ensure that yes, we must uh, develop the, the signing level skills, but we also must make sure that this, the people that have been in the field for so long haven't become quite narrow in their, their approach. We must actually recognise that there's a broad range of experiences out there which, which everyone within the field can learn from. And I think that we, we, we must look to to that, that broader experience, I would say. I will also make the, the point that it's, this isn't just about teachers or educational audiologists and so on, and, and making sure that there's training for that, but actually a lot of deaf children are supported by you know, very effective pupil support staff and ensuring that their skills are recognised and they actually feel valued within that setup, and they're actually valued members of the team. And that's how services should work locally. It should make sure that it's a it's a collegiate approach with the, the, um, the, the, a whole range of staff, and not have a sort of a hierarchy of you know teachers of the deaf and support staff. So I think there's a whole range of things that need that could be put in place. I would endorse what Brian says about having interested and committed staff eh, and about valuing those staff who have the qualifications. We support continuing lifelong professional learning for our teachers, but there 
something about the pathway to becoming a, a, a teacher of the deaf or a teacher of the visually impaired. There's lots of support for learning courses that people can do. There's lots of in-house training. Our own sensory support staff deliver very high quality sessions to staff in schools. But at the moment, if you're a teacher in a school who's thinking about that, really, you, you could only go into the job and then train to gain the qualification while you're in that post. Maybe we should consider some interim qualification around additional support needs so that people who might be considering that rather than go from none at all to then suddenly everybody training. Because I know when people are training, what they do need to do is work alongside someone who is experienced and can support them. It, it can be quite a lonely job, I think, if you're a peripatetic teacher and you're the voice for sensory impairment when you go out into a school and you're an unpromoted teacher and you may be uh, explaining and challenging principal teachers and deputy heads. So maybe some some pathway in there and some incentive for people to take that, that route. Um. I endorse the looking at uh, the range of qualifications, how that develops, and uh, some of that could be focused within uh, Teaching Scotland's future. Um, for ourselves, we have engaged with um, a group of deaf practitioners, um, deaf teachers, and uh, we have discussed with them about how we could support their career-long professional learning through ways of them gaining professional recognition, which is part and parcel of the GTCS, um, approach for professional learning and that, that may be something that we can resource. Th thanks very much for that. Um, across visually impaired and hearing impaired pupils, th there's a range of hearing and vision problems. And what I wanted to ask was, do we have the appropriate levels of teaching staff within our mainstream schools or our support units or our specialist schools, because obviously it's it's tailored to whatever the children's uh, requirements or need is. So, do we? Where are the gaps? Is it is it predominantly within mainstream schools, or is it across the piece? I mean, mainstream schools. A mainstream teacher sitting with thirty children in front of her, and one of them is deaf. It's a challenge to meet the needs of that of that child. They maybe have a deaf child maybe once or twice in their whole their whole teaching career so it, it's important that they are supported and they are supported by teacher of the deaf and it's important that the, the strategies that that teacher needs to use to include the deaf child within the class is, is they're aware of them but all, all, it always depends on who the teacher is how how willing they are to take on board that information, how willing they are to make use of the, of the uh, equipment that's in, in, uh, in place. So within mainstream schools, there are limitations to the, the, the skills of a mainstream teacher, and that's ob ob it's going to be obvious. Uh, I think with the specialist knowledge that the teachers of the deaf have, that most teachers of the deaf in Scotland will go to Murray House to do a postgraduate diploma in deaf education, where they'll learn about deaf studies, they'll learn about appropriate curriculum for deaf children and learn about teaching English to deaf children a big area about assessments special assessments for deaf children so I'd say that teachers and teachers have to I mean a, a it's mandatory that within five years of working with deaf children, they are qualified as a teacher of the deaf. So I think that we're well served by Edinburgh University, and when teachers do come out, they are they are they have the skills to meet the needs of deaf children. It's just getting more of teachers of the deaf qualified is the, is the issue. I'd say that. Um, Kind of going back to the training, one of the, the methods that was used by um, the, the I think the Scottish government to try and increase numbers was to do away with actually the having to attend the the, the course at, at Murray House and go through the competency route where there was internal uh, verification of your standards. Now the problem is that um, that practice might not actually necessarily be good practice, and therefore you're in a sense learning bad practice, and it's been verified. Um, I I think that. We, the numbers and the number of deaf children involved and the number of staff involved means that we we must use an empowering model. We must be empowering the teachers to take that responsibility, which they do now through their, their registration. Um, 
but they also we must empower the, the kids to have a, a, an understanding of their deafness, and, and that can be in relation to their, their language, to, to audiology, etc. And, and it comes back to them being the, the, the people that will in, in, enforce change in, in, in a sense. So the, the staff have to we have to move in a sense from that expert-driven model to a, a, a different model of support. I don't think it is just about places. I think it's actually about changing how how we in our profession work with schools and with families and, and in a sense, give up some of that that, 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 that power, as it were. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, I, I would concur with Brian about empowerment. I mean, you have teachers working and they, they can have classes of 30 and in that class you will have children, maybe one or two with sensory impairment, but you'll have children on the autistic spectrum disorder, you'll have children with social and emotional needs, you'll have children with mental health issues, you might have a child who's um, feeling the impact of bereavement at that point in their school career. And I think our teachers are becoming more and more attuned to understanding, responding to and supporting a range of additional support needs that I find our staff are very open and receptive to learn more about anything that will help them to support the children in front of them. They're willingly uh, take on strategies. They'll go to uh, twilight classes. They, I think they would take up opportunities to, to skill themselves more around sensory impairment. But it is also about uh, the children and young people themselves being empowered, as Brian says, to, to challenge and, and to get the support they need. Question, which is, Richard, if you don't mind. Yeah, indeed. Um, where, the, where, where does the shortage of qualified staff bite most? Um, I think it bites everywhere, but I think where it actually has the most impact actually is a small in population local authority that may be covering a wide area where they have a very, very small um, team of, uh, of, of VI teachers who are very stretched, and to lose one, you, you're losing the reach to a group of pupils. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark. I just wanted to ask, um, in relation to pupils who use British Sign Language as their only language, are, are we setting those pupils up to fail by saying it's acceptable that they can be taught um, by a teacher who only has a level one qualification in that language? I would say to a certain extent we are, because we're not giving them... If you're accessing the curriculum, the, the secondary curriculum, for example, uh, be that, you know, the breadth of that curriculum, you need to have teachers there who have the ability, or, or interpreters, or you know, who have the ability to uh, interpret across the curriculum. And so you need to have the sign language skills to do that. And, it, and that's why it's important we, we, we increase the sign language skills. And, and a lot of teachers, uh, deaf children also have told us that the sign language skills of their teachers often aren't, aren't good enough. Uh, I mean, how, it's not only just about uh, sign language skills, but it's also about knowledge of the curriculum as well. If you're signing, for example, in higher physics, you need to understand higher physics if you're, to be actually give a, a proper interpretation. You can't interpret things that you don't understand. So we're needing a, it's a highly skilled job working in a secondary school to have, those, have the, the sign language skills, but also have the, the, the skills to, uh, to interpret across the curriculum. There's a lot of talk about getting interpreters into secondary schools, but I'm, which I, I think that would be a good move to a certain extent, but I think this, the subject knowledge, you have to have an interpreter who really understands the subject knowledge too. So I think, to answer to your question, I think we are failing some deaf children because we're not giving them good access to the curriculum due to the sign language skills of those who are providing that access. Yeah. I think also that we... It, it's a team approach, it, certainly within Fife. So we have, you know, it's not just teachers of the deaf that are working with the BSL children. It's, we've, as I said, we've got really effective um, pupil support staff who, who have got um, qualifications. Um, but yes, there, there needs to be a, there needs to be more training opportunities for like for the support staff um, and incentives for them um, career-wise. I think within teachers of the deaf, absolutely, that there needs to be a review of the, the level one standard. But generally, you know, people will be, teachers will be directed towards, ideally, um, the skills base will match the child, as it were. Um, but that absolutely needs to be reviewed. Um, Mr. Watt and 
in particular on this subject, given the answers that we've had, that why it's appropriate for teachers of a spoken language for a, the minimum qualification um, for a teacher of a spoken language is a, is a higher in English. And yet for teachers of the deaf, the minimum language is level one, um, which is described as basic, and level three being equivalent to a higher grade. Why is there that disparity between teachers of the deaf and teachers of a spoken language? Um, we do need to continue to improve the qualifications of those using uh, BSL in our schools. There's, there's no doubt about that. That uh, could be a, a key explanatory factor of the gap in terms of achievement, that, um, that uh, impingement along language development. It's, it's, uh, it's not a question of, of shying away from that. Um, so there, there could be further boosts within the, um, generally within the, uh, one plus two languages approach. We're looking to broaden out uh, BSL both as uh, within first language, but also as uh, uh, L3, that it's open to anyone to study BSL. We're looking at that just now. Um, we can continue to prove the qualifications. It would still be the case um, for any learner that uh, they would be more skilled in using language than their teacher. And uh, that's a challenge for teachers that somebody uh, smarter than them is in their class. So how do they ingest their practice to take account of uh, learners that are smarter than them? Um, um, again, it's about being in ensuring that you can provide the right support to the right person. Uh, but if your medium of, of learning uh, is uh, BSL, uh, you should be looking to uh, achieve greater than that. Um, and more could be done there. Quick supplementary. Yeah, just a quick supplementary there. Yesterday, at we saw uh, two pupils in exam and, and being you know, there was a communication with cameras and what have you. What, what level does can technology play in terms of you know videos, applications, in terms of having centralised teaching? While we have this paucity of, of of educationalists, what can we do, particularly in the case of deaf uh, deaf impaired, to use technology meaningfully to spread? Over the bad schools as well as the good, as the good schools, you know, a faster, fast track educational system. I'm maybe not going to answer your question. I'm sorry about that. But I'm going to look, talk a wee bit about what the, the experience you had yesterday of watching children accessing their exams in in sign language. And I will come on to technology a bit at the end of that. I. In Scotland, deaf children are now able to, since 2000, they have their exams delivered in sign language and they can also now respond in sign language. And I, I, I'm, I'm proud that Scotland does, uh, allows that access. It's not, it's not provided in England. Uh, will, although there are issues around accessing your exams in that way, the issues are the sign language skills of the person who's delivering the exam and also the subject knowledge of the person who's delivering the, the exam, and also the protocols which they're using when, when actually in, in that exam room. Now, there has been a pilot done using technology to provide better access to examination arrangements. And what that has been is working with SQA, and I think it was Scottish Census Centre, uh, producing a PDF of the exam oh, with a, 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 a video for each question alongside which you click on and a good quality interpretation of the exam questions are provided within, within actually within the, the exam itself. So children, deaf children can access the exams without having their teacher with them. Can you imagine how that feels when you've got your teacher sitting watching you do an exam? They can watch the question being delivered as many times as they like, because can you imagine that feeling as if, can I have that question again? Can you repeat that question? How that makes you feel, you know? So giving children ownership of their own exam and also providing a good quality interpretation of the exam, which with the hope that that will provide better access to examinations for deaf I understand children. that, mm -hmm. but it's getting them to the stage of, you know, using technology as it is today, and where we have a shortage of, of, of educationalists, how do we, how can we centralise and use technology to ensure that pupils can plug in to a teaching session? Probably not be able to centralise that because the answer will be with uh, children's own devices. 
Um, and that's a challenge it faces us just now in terms of a balance between uh, having secure intranet within our schools and uh, having young people able to use the technology that they, they use out with school. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a tension in there. Um, and, and so kids are wanting to use their phone, um, but the, the, the Wi-Fi and internet's not there for them to do that. And um, the, the making the use of that um, mobile technology is, is something that um, is, is continually to engage with because it is, as you're saying, part of the answer. Centralised teaching for children who live in remote and rural communities around the world has been commonplace through radio for decades. I remember when I was a child watching Blue Peter and they talked about children in the outback, outback being taught through the radio. Um, why is it such a problem or why are we so slow at adapting uh, visual means of technology to do exactly the same process to teach children remotely using uh, a single teacher teaching multiple pupils um, in the way that Chick Brody has just asked? Well, we, we, we do have a facility. Um, it's called Go, and we continue to build capacity within Go uh, to uh, have it as a national intranet. Um, we would want more teachers, more young people to, to use Go. You can access that on your phone now, and you can uh, engage with it in a variety of ways. Maybe, I'm, maybe it's the way I'm saying it, but I'm, I'm not talking about people use, accessing a, a website on their phone. What I'm talking about is there's a set lesson with a, with a teacher using who's very high quality skills, BSL, for example, um, and is teaching a lesson which children in various schools across the country can sit down and access. At 10 o'clock on a Wednesday morning, the, the lesson will be X, and those ch children can access that lesson. Uh, well, that uh, f facility, not in that format, but people could uh, tie into a Glow Meet, a Glow event at uh, a, a prescribed time. Um, if, you're, if you're looking at um, the, a national centre for provision of uh, a range of lessons, um, that's, that's not on the agenda. Well, it's, it's uh, in part that uh, education authorities have the responsibility for the provision of education and uh, there's uh, the, the buy-in to the, the use of, of, of GO operates as, as and when uh, schools, classrooms, teachers, young people make use of GO. It's, not a, it's, a, it's a dispersed system, it's not a centralised system mm. in that respect. Okay, I'm going to, I, I, mean, I'm, I don't think that's very satisfactory, but I'm going to ask other members of the panel their view on this. Brian, you wanted to come in? I was going to say, certainly um, one school that was mentioned earlier is a good practice with St Margaret's, which is one I've been involved in, which isn't actually a resource-based but mainstream provision. And certainly technology was used there um, as, as core, not only to make um, books accessible, so we would, we would sign um, pretty much all the books into BSL um, and that made them that made them a resource that's being now used in different schools and nurseries within Fife. But it was also a way to develop the children within the mainstream schools language skills. So we would use for instance software such as Clicker and, and so on and incorporate video into that and that became, allowed um, the development of uh, the children within the schools signing skills. So it might be that centralised resources, or I think there's, there's the option of some way of sharing those types of the resources should be certainly explored, because I'm sure we're not the only authority sitting in making resources, um, and, and, but also looking at the types of technology uh, would also be worth investigating. Finally, I think one of the things that does, let's slightly moving away from, uh, from sign, exclusively from sign, but, but subtitling, I think the, a whole range of issues around making um, video resources and DVD resources within schools, making them subtitle friendly. Could I also Thanks. say... Very, very briefly, uh -huh. you don't mind. Sure, no worries. I think a, a Scottish Census Centre has an example of good practice. They have quite a lot of BSL resources linked to the curriculum. They have a glossary for all the technical signs, but they also have video clips of a... a in a experiments, science experiments, etc., which are linked to the curriculum. So we could look there at, as, as 
as a starting point to, to see what, what kind of resources we could be creating. Because I think it'd be wonderful for deaf children to be able to go on the, on, on the internet and access BSL uh, resources in BSL that link with the curriculum. Voice to, to text software within schools would be very useful for subtitling for, what, for teachers you know, as they speak to have the subtitles coming up. That would allow better access too and that would be something I would like to see a bit of research in, in, into. Okay, thank you. Uh, Liam, you wanted to come back to mainstreaming. Yeah, j I, j just very briefly. Um, I, I think, I, Eileen, you touched on it in... Um, in answer to an earlier question, and, and actually in terms of the written evidence, I think you, you kick it off with um, the statement that it's well documented that deaf young people individually placed in mainstream schools often feel isolated and go on to make that link in terms of the prevalence of, of mental health. It came up in the panel discussion last week as well. I don't think it was necessarily in opposition to the presumption of mainstreaming, but actually the way in which the application of that presumption works um, doesn't necessarily always recognise the needs at each age and stage of those with a sensory uh, impairment. I think, uh, I think it was Rachel O'Neill um, went as far as to say it was, it was actually doing a disservice um, to, uh, to, to deaf children uh, in, in, in some senses. I was just interested to know from the, the panel this week whether there's a feeling that, that that is the case and if there are things that we can maybe do um, to modify that presumption to make sure that at each age and stage it's, it's working in the best interests, either of the visually impaired or, or the hearing impaired. I think that local authorities have to look at the provision for deaf children and it's not one size fits all, right? Deaf children are individuals and they need choices, but I'd like to see each lo local authority or local authorities working together, if they're smaller local authorities, providing a resource-based provision for deaf children to allow, because for, for the reasons, for the I isolation, for a, creating the opportunity, a realistic opportunity to teach sign language to a good level to their hearing peers, uh, and that would uh, decrease isolation. Providing, having access to deaf uh, role models, having deaf people coming to the school, maybe having deaf teachers there, you know, having English taught effectively, having skilled staff. I, the advantages have it of having the deaf. I've watched children in, in resource spaces and realised from my experience how important it is that they have a deaf peer group to communicate with. In primary school, deaf uh, children tend to communicate more physically, you know, they run around, etc. But when it comes to secondary school si situation, uh, that is much more a uh, language-based uh, interaction and relationships. And it's that, at that time, deaf children have issues in the playground, keeping up with their hearing peers. And uh, having a deaf uh, group is good for their deaf identity also. They, they don't see themselves as the only deaf person. They, and I, I just feel there's uh, so many advantages to the resource-based type approach. And I'd like to see local authorities offering that as a very positive option for, for deaf children because deaf people, because I feel as if we're not listening to deaf people really, they've been telling us this for a long time, you know, that uh, individually placed in mainstream schools is, is not a positive, hasn't had a positive experience and I, I do feel we're, we're, the people who are making the decisions of where children are going are maybe not really listening and, and the option of the resource space has not been, is, is go, to, go to your mainstream school, but if it doesn't work for you, so there's a wee bit of kind of wait till you fail there before you go to the resource space, rather than, I think you said that, rather than having the, having the resource space as the positive first option. Okay. It's dif difficult to take children away from the local community. I'm not saying that, that you shouldn't do that just, you know, you know but, but I think we, the evidence is there that deaf children feel more positive, have a pos positive identity, and and have the, the skills there within that resource space for them to attain more effectively. Yeah, with visual impaired children, that <clears throat> there is no doubt uh, a, a, a real benefit in children with a visual impairment meeting children, other children with visual impairments, sharing their life experience and doing things together. Um, but it's not a kind of one-size-fits-all, and there's all kinds of visual impairments, um, and, and ranging from, from the totally blind to those with low vision, um, and, and they can mix with, to different degrees and with different degrees of success uh, in a mainstream environment. And I think there's probably an argument with visually impaired children to, where possible, give them the opportunity um, to mix with other children with visual impairment, but it doesn't necessarily mean that for most of the time they're not in their, their mainstream school with the appropriate support. 
And, and I think I come back to this whole confidence thing. It's about the confidence to be included um, and to claim your part of, of, the, uh, of the activities of the school as well as being given your part of the activities of the school. Point about the earlier the intervention and the support that's yeah. put in place, the, the more likely that then lasts through the, the remainder Very of the much. school. Very right. much, yes. And the rest of the, the, the children in the school get used to accommodating the child with a visual impairment as part of the group. And I know that that gets challenging when people move from primary through to secondary because the way that social groups of children operate become different again. And I think there's a need to be aware that you know, a child who's become very settled towards the end of primary actually faces a great big challenge on transition as well. I'd say that there's always been a spectrum of support and there should remain a spectrum of, of support. Um, but it, in many ways, it's parents that, that, that drive the, the, the change away, certainly from the days where there was high numbers and resource bases and so on. You know, I, I, I'm there supporting families from the, at the very beginning, sharing the news. And one of the first questions, it's one of the, one of the, the most common questions is, will they go to their local school? Um, now, resource bases, as I said, have historically always been there, and they haven't always been a driver, coming back to the purpose of the meeting, of, of, of raising attainment. Um, as I said, it's about different models of support. I'll give you an example, just to, 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 to almost put a, a point towards the, the notion that it's always isolation. In St Margaret's, where there was an inspection, the, the inspectors fed back to the head teacher, and they actually commented on an issue that happened in the lunch hall. And there was the deaf child, and she was with two of her friends, and they, they were all signing. And the deaf child got up to put their, their tray into the, 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 the waste part, and the two kids continued on their conversation in sign. So we can have success. It's about models of support. It's about finding things that work as much as about placement or devaluing the role of the resource bases. Mm. Gilliam, we're going to uh, yeah. move on. Briefly. I think Alison is going to well, It can be very brief. Uh, we'll just very briefly, you see that uh, it is quite often to do with choice that young people want to be in a mainstream secondary with their peers so, and they're very much supported to be part of that school community. Uh, that can change, so we consult with young people. We have friendship groups, and when we asked children with sensory impairment, the younger children were very keen and they meet at Isabel Mayer School. Uh, together, they're brought together as a group regularly. Older pupils have attended more as buddies, uh, but they're now expressing more interest. And we have Corrie House, a separate house, a life skills house, so that young people are going. The plans are that older young people will meet there. Um, we have a teacher of the deaf who is himself deaf, and that has been a, 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 a tremendous uh, person to have in the team uh, to raise awareness of, of deafness and, and other sensory impairment. I think we need to remember with inclusion that uh, by having children with sensory impairment in schools alongside mainstream colleagues with other additional support needs, we increase the understanding of additional support needs across the board mm -hmm. for when they go out into the world of work. Okay, th thank you. Yeah, Eileen, sorry, I, I'm, sorry. I'm going to have to stop you there because right. we're really running out of time. And I've still got a couple of members who want to ask some questions. Uh, Siobhan. Thank you. I want to start with the Education Scotland um, submission that we had, Mr Watt, um, and to say I was concerned about the conclusion um, is quite an understatement, but there's six paragraphs here, and if I, if I read out the start of a few of them, education authorities and schools need to, education authorities and schools also need to track. There is also a need for education authorities and schools to continue to improve. What is there a need for Education Scotland to do? What we need to do is to ensure that uh, some of those messages of the, the data are passed, are passed in through the system, that people take account of that, I think, within a, uh, an approach that uh, looks to boost the inclusiveness, uh, both uh, that takes account of those additional support needs, but has our schools as, as places where uh, it's... Uh, you're, it's not a barrier to your learning from your, your social background, your disability, your gender. Uh, there's a story to be told in there that we haven't uh, 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 distributed enough. I think Education Scotland can provide platforms for teachers to come together to consider what they need uh, from us in order to benefit uh, their uh, uh, delivery of a system. Uh, that includes taking account of... Um, the one plus two languages, BSLs, place within that and give a greater boost to aspects of communication within uh, literacy and, and English uh, and have BSL as part of a, a, 
a diverse language policy within our schools. I think there's boosts that we can also do for uh, children and young people to give them uh, perhaps uh, not just a voice, but a way and means of expressing that voices, those voices within um, their reviews, within their classrooms, and that they uh, have a degree of ownership and responsibility of how they deal with their support. I think we have got a, a challenging agenda ourselves as well as schools and authorities. There is more that we can do, yes. I appreciate you putting that in evidence um, because that was that was missing from the written submission. Um, I'll, I'll move on to the independent living skills, skills and the habilitation skills that were spoken about earlier. Um, and I asked um, the panels last week about how important these are and that's come up in evidence already this morning so I don't wish to go over that but I do wish to see how far curriculum for excellence can be used um, in that capacity in order to give people independent living skills but also is there other models that we should be looking at is it simply curriculum for excellence or is there something else out there that's working um, that, that maybe we should be looking at for, for further evidence for excellence and deaf children. I think curriculum for excellence is an excellent framework actually for taking forward deaf children. It has the flexibility, it allows us to build a curriculum which is relevant to deaf children. There's personalisation, choice, and th th that's important because the curriculum for deaf children will not be the same as a curriculum for uh, for hearing children with respect to English language, with respect to deaf studies with, and all these sort of things. So I think in lots of ways, curriculum for ex excellence is a good framework to meet the needs of deaf children and I don't think it holds any barriers to that. One, one, barrier, one problem possibly uh, is that uh, curriculum for excellence really encourages active types of learning. Classroom environments are different now than they were in the past. For the, uh, and that's a good thing. But the, but with uh, children working more in groups with a uh, more discussion within classrooms so they tend to become more n noisier environments which is an issue for our children I mean but, and I would say that so we have to look at that environment and say well how can we make it accessible for our deaf children now that we do have technology we do have things like roaming mics for children working in groups can make use of a microphone children that the deaf child's got the radio aid so but these things have to be available they have to be used they need to need to people need to teachers know, need to know how to use them and feel confident about using them adaptations possibly if there's group working a deaf child within a group you might say you know you're working in this group but actually you can move to this quiet area with your group to allow you to have access so curriculum effects i think is the hold, I don't feel it holds any barriers, but I think we have to look at the, the it creates a classroom environment which can be quite a challenge for, for deaf children. Thank you. Um, does anyone disagree with that? Richard, do you want to add something? I, I disagree with it. I'd just uh, say yes, curriculum for excellence has been great for, for VI education because it actually accentuates quite a few of the things we've always needed to accentuate in VI education. And it's, it works across the whole school. So absolutely fantastic. Um, we don't really, um, we're not really come in with suggestions for different curricula of that kind, but simply indeed in, in terms of building in habilitation and daily living skills for any child who has um, special needs that affect their life skills. I think there's probably a need to actually consider that as being part of the school curriculum for them. Just finally, Mr. Sharon, you spoke about what's happening in Fife and about how um, the videos and using BSL and, and various others. Obviously, that's an example of good practice that's happening in Fife that we weren't aware of, obviously, until today. So, so how do we get that good practice and the, the sharing of good practice? How do we become better at that? That's a, that's a very good question. I think um, potentially there might be a role, as I said, potentially for, for the Scottish Sensory Centre. They, they've generally been a, a body that's quite respected throughout Scotland, I would say. Um, and it's maybe looking to see how um, resources they are. It's about highlighting that not just the resources that are being made, but the technology that's being used to, to, to make them. So maybe the, 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 the SSC could hold maybe more um, satellite type um, courses throughout throughout Scotland. One of the things that, had, for instance, had been suggested in the past when we met with them, the Scottish, um, one of the Scottish civil servants, was that uh, in relation to 
this is in relation not to video, but in relation, in relation to um, audiology equipment and being used. Um, it was maybe trying to use um, the skills and good practice and then maybe have road shows, if you like, in different parts of Scotland because it, it is quite challenging if you're a, an authority up in the, the Highlands or something to come down to, to a, a, a course in Edinburgh. Maybe more use of, of um, web-based learning, things like that may be provide uh, options. Thank you. Um, the Royal Blind School has always done some outward facing work and has always been on the end of the phone for teachers with a, uh, children with a visual impairment who have a particular issue. They would phone into the school and ask um, and we'd be happy to help with that. That's always been a kind of quiet support that we've done. We're actually kind of changing the way we go about that this year and launching a new thing called the Learning Hub um, which will complement the work that the SSC does um, with e-learning seminars and other things, very much about basic um, access to the curriculum um, for a child with a visual impairment. And it's, some, it's, it's going to be a resource that a teacher who has a child with a visual impairment in their class um, can hook up with, um, both on the net and in terms of real life and consulting us, and we can go out there and support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, George. Convener, uh, I would like to ask about adaptions, and we've, we've, had much, we've discussed them already quite a bit with regards to technology and its use for uh, uh, BSL users. But maybe if I could ask about the visually impaired, you know, what is the, the most cost-effective adaptions or the best way forward for us for the visually impaired? As we've mentioned before that there's a spectrum of need, of course, and that, that needs differ according to the individual pupil. Um, for those who are, are Braille users, then to, to be able to have access to your computer through a Braille interface is actually very, very valuable indeed. Um, for those with low vision, um, particularly magnifiers, and magnifiers come in all kinds of different kinds um, and sizes, but... Um, depending on what your site need is and how it's best helped, you have a magnifier that sits on your desk, you can put written things under it and it will come up with the colour differentiation that helps your own sight loss. Um, but you also can have magnifiers whereby you can see what's on display at the front of the class, displayed in, next to you on your own desk. Um, and simple things like actually having enough desk space so that you can have um, that, uh, uh, those aids available to you that's close to a PowerPoint um, and, and in terms of designing a school to actually enable that to happen and that the right colour contrasts are there so that the child can uh, orient themselves in the environment. A lot of it's really quite basic but things that an architect won't necessarily think of when they're, when they're designing a building. You see the, the, uh, the colour variations, it was something I was totally unaware of until I was given one of these pairs of glasses with a constituent who had a, I've always known was visually impaired and it was years ago I was a counsellor at the time and I was actually doing the, I, I did a, an assessment of the local authority building and I tripped over the the stairs because there was no differentiation yeah. in the colour and it was it was a, a simple case of just some paint was enough to make the difference yeah and uh, also the council didn't think someone six foot three would have a visual impairment so I battered my head off a TV screen yeah but apart from that <laughs> I understand a lot of these kind of they can be quite simple as well you know there can be quite simple uh, solutions to some of the issues yeah that's right uh, but it really is a matter of getting the tooling right for the child. Um, and that's where we come back to this question of qualification and learning um, on the part of the staff to be able to actually tailor uh, what the child needs to their actual need. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to finish one one question to Mr. Watt. It goes back to the, the statistics. Um, um, in your submission, you say that... Um, the national average of attending higher and further education is 64 per cent and it's 68 per cent for both hearing and visually impaired. Um, um, you know, effectively, you're talking about the, uh, the higher outcomes for those with a, a hearing or visual impairment uh, in terms of positive destinations. I'm just wondering if that's helpful or rather, in fact, um, just throws up a fog in terms of the reality of what's happening to young people who have either a visual or a hearing impairment. I'm looking at the figures that we have, in, for example, the average tariff score of deaf pupils compared with all pupils at S4 by SIMD. At every single level, I don't know whether you can see that, but every single level, deaf pupils are further behind um, than uh, the average 
of all Scottish pupils. And the same with, uh, in terms of SCQF Level 2, right up to SCQF Level 7 or better. You've got visual impairment, hearing impairment, and uh, no ASN. And on every level, they are behind, at the beginning, just marginally behind, I would say. But at the end, you know, only achieving a third of the outcomes um, of those pupils without either a visual or hearing impairment. You know, I, I'm concerned, and, I want, and this is the question I want to ask you, that the figures you've given about positive destinations and attending college, effectively, is in fact masking the reality of the situation for young people who have a visual or a hearing impairment. And, and, and to, not to put it too brutally, we were, we were told yesterday about children being, and I, I used the word that was used, dumped in college courses and been, been, been just effectively been put in a college course and they sit there and they do another college course, another college course, another college, until eventually it just becomes, they have to eventually leave college. But basically, it's not really a positive destination, is it? I mean, I think there's... Uh, Two points in there. One, the, the, the gap uh, remains. It's narrowing. So it's an improving picture over the past few years. I think we have to uh, give ourselves credit for that in Scotland. It's an improving picture, but it's still too wide. And uh, you've marked out that kids gaining the qualifications for higher education are at a much lower level than, than the average. Um, the, the positive destinations is... Um, for most young people, um, that can be a positive outcome because I think within the, the senior phase now and moving into FE, there are routes into higher education through that. Um, it, it tends to be the issue you've described of, uh, you know, it's almost it's, uh, a warm place for a, a, a period of time. It, that tends to be for those with more complex needs. Um, and... Uh, going beyond FE uh, and going beyond that positive destination, which might just be for a year, uh, what happens after that um, for those with complex needs and for some of those with disabilities in general in terms of employment uh, is, has been flagged up within the Developing the Young Workforce, the WID Report, Education for All, uh, across disabilities, ethnic minorities, gender and uh, uh, care leavers as uh, again an area that needs uh, if not an acceptable needs uh, further improvement um, so that raises a question against businesses and, and employment and uh, I actually think there's more that the public sector could do in terms of supported employment and opportunities for those with disabilities both national government and local authorities uh, that's a challenge for us all um, the FE picture it can be masking um, those that are that are uh, to use your term, dumped, but it can also be that that is a positive destination. It is something that uh, young people with disabilities just need a bit longer time to work through and don't just leave at fifth year to go to university and, and move on. So there, there's a, there can be a positive story in there. Um, it's not my term. I have to hasten to add. It's right. a term that was used um, by somebody who clearly was frustrated, frustrated by the, the, the situation that they felt their own child was facing um, but thank you very much for that I think you know but while accepting the positive destinations can be FE and of course can be incredibly positive destination for many pupils I think clearly there is an issue as you so rightly said yourself going beyond that into employment clearly the employment rates of those with a visual impairment or a, or a hearing impairment are very very different from the average uh, so clearly something still well let's put it this way there's still a lot of work to do Okay, on that point, can I thank you all very much for attending this morning. We're very grateful for you coming along and giving of your time to the committee. Uh, next week, we will take evidence from the Scottish Government on this area, and I'm sure we're all looking forward to that. So uh, thank you very much, and with that, I close the meeting.